Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the AIA California, second in our series of town halls on California urban design, housing for all. I'm Rona Rothenberg, and it's my honor to be here to host this session. I'm AIA California's Vice President of Government Relations. Before I introduce our moderator, Gwyn Pugh, FAIA, and my colleague, as well as our august panelists, Leonora Kemner, Robin Hughes, Jeff Oberdorfer, and Roger Sherman, a few housekeeping things to note. Today's session is being recorded and will be available both on AIA California's website and YouTube channels shortly following the event. The discussion qualifies for AIA learning units. For AIA members who stay on for the duration, staff will submit for your credit. The learning unit should appear in your transcript within two weeks. Following short presentations by each panelist, we'll open the floor for questions. Please use the Q&A feature located in the upper or lower menu bar of your Zoom with questions for our panel. Now on to today's town hall. Like water, air, and food, sustainable affordable housing is a human necessity. Within the last two decades, housing as we know has become increasingly unaffordable as some communities push back on housing density, inclusionary housing, and gentrification of marginalized neighborhoods as a cheap way to encourage economic revitalization in some ways, housing is the single largest investment families will undertake or an ongoing expense they'll incur. This panel of architects, urban planners, and activists will present innovative approaches and opportunities, rethinking housing for everyone. Today's moderator is Gwen Pugh, Gwen Pugh, FAIA. Gwen has been practicing architecture planning, civil, structural, and design engineering since 1971. He led Pew and Scarpa Architects for 22 years. During this time as principal, his firm received over 20 national and international awards, including AIA Re National Architecture Firm of the Year Award in 2010, and over 50 local awards, including the AIA Council Firm of the Year Award. In 2010, Gwyn started his new venture, Gwyn Pew Urban, design, Urban Studio, designed to focus on community in the built environment so as to enhance the experience of people and places. Gwyn, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and welcome everybody. Um, so I think what we're trying to bring to this is a slightly more global vision uh, for how we approach housing. Uh, Obviously, uh, it is very easy to get stuck in the weeds as to how to develop a particular housing project. But I think that the, the vision that is the larger vision is really one of our communities and what those communities are like. The concept perhaps of, of uh, complete communities, communities where um, you have people of all ages from seniors to children. You have uh, people of all income groups, uh, ethnicity, a variety in the ethnicity. And part of this is that we are, it's a symbiotic relationship. Um, seniors can help look after the children you know, when they come home from school or, uh, you know, the, the person that's the local barista, uh, are they part of your community? Uh, is the, are the nurses and school teachers in your community? So for instance, if there's a wildfire or if there's an earthquake, as we've certainly experienced in California, who do you look after first, those in your community? And if you're living far away from the community that has the hospital and has the needs, uh, then you know we can get into a, a discordant uh, place. Uh, also having communities where we can live, work and play uh, allows us to make a lot of the trips not by car, although a car is an important element in our society uh, and we will have that, I'm sure, far into the future. If we can reduce those trips or use alternative public transportation, then I think it gives us the possibility of making a far more sustainable 
and environmentally desirable environment that we're in and we don't get caught up in the gridlock of cars. It's also the idea of um, ha having sort of pods in a way so that, for instance, with this pandemic, is sort of understanding where the, where the uh, incidents occur and being able to trace them is much easier than if it's very divergent and people can take um, responsibility for what's going on. So a complete community allows for culture, resilience, sustainability, um, and resources. But is that really the kind of cities that we are having at the moment? We know that we really are working with the issue of the unhoused. Uh, we, we see our societies being segregated and becoming very monochromatic. People having to make many trips, much longer trips and much harder trips because the facilities and resources are not local. And also there's that idea of unsafe uh, environments being unsafe. So how can we change all of that? And what's, what's the story that we're looking at? So I think with that, we'll look to our panelists. I think they have a lot to say on this and we look, really look forward with, to, to that. So we're gonna start off with uh, Leonora. She's a, an activist um, and I think she will be looking at what it takes to make housing happen in an environment where there's often a significant resistance. So she, we look forward to what she has to say about that. Leonora has been a member and a volunteer of Abundant Housing LA since 2016. Uh, previously, she worked in eviction defense. In addition to being a YIMBY, uh, yes, in my backyard, uh, Leonora is a believer in RENA, the Regional Housing Needs Assessment, uh, and the housing element process and the need to create funding for housing subsidies. She's currently serving in Santa Monica Housing Commission. Outside of Abundant Housing LA, Leonora is a mom of two girls. And Leonora, take it away. Thank you so much. I'm just gonna share my screen. Okay. Hello everyone. People are facing a terrible housing crisis. Rents are too high and people are being displaced. If we continue down this road, our cities will have lost their communities and failed on climate goals. My name is Leonora Kamner and I'm Executive Director of Abundant Housing LA. We are a growing movement of people demanding more homes to address rents, traffic, and climate change. We invite anyone who wants a better housing future to join us in changing the housing conversation. Together, we'll build cities that reflect our values and respect human life and the environment. So I'm just going to start out this presentation with a little uh, kind of a weird hypothetical experiment, so bear with me. Imagine that you have a really large collection of books. You could either store them by stacking them up on shelves vertically, or you could lay them out side by side, flat, one at a time across the floor of your house. Obviously, if you lay them out flat, you will not have enough room for all of your books. So that, that doesn't make any sense, that sounds really weird, but that's actually exactly what we do for housing in Los Angeles and many other cities in America. We ban multifamily apartment buildings, which would allow people to live more vertically. And so we have this very low density zoning across Los Angeles. You can see in Los Angeles, 75% of our residential area, that's the pink here, is zoned for single family only. So that's the lowest density type of housing. And so why would we choose a system that is so problematic, which means not enough people can live in our urban areas, which means that you know we're constantly having to have displacement because there just isn't enough housing for people? Well, the answer is that historic and continuing racism is really at the heart of this. You know, no surprise, the answer is our history of racism, as it is with so many things in America. So to just go back and uh, discuss this history of racism, you know, for a long time, explicitly exclusionary and racist um, housing practices were considered desirable. You know, that's something that advertisements from the early 20th century 
had, a, they mentioned, you know, as a selling point for, um, for people to come and buy homes. So, you know, these are some examples of those advertisements where they're calling out explicit racial exclusion uh, as a desirable aspect of these communities. So, you know, the residents of Eagle Rock are all of the white or Caucasian race, this says. And so in addition to, to that, there was also the history of redlining, uh, which I'm sure many people are familiar with, you know, insurance practices that affected people's ability to, to buy homes based on what insurance companies deemed as, as desirable communities. And so if you see in this map of LA comparing a redlined area to a greenlined area, um, this is exactly what was written for, for those areas. So this greenlined area uh, says that 0% foreign families, 0% uh, black population, shifting our infiltration, none apparent or anticipated. And then uh, you can see in the redlined area, the language that was used to describe diversity, you know, like very negative language um, that you know, I'm not gonna say out loud, but uh, you can see just how, um, just how racialized our housing institutions were just not, not very long ago, even like just early 20th century. So what does it have to do with today? Single family zoning is the current method of exclusion. You know, it, in the 1920s, explicitly racist zoning was banned by the Supreme Court. And so single family only zoning was created as a way to get around that the court's ruling. It allowed cities and neighborhoods to continue segregation because the only homes that were allowed to be built are, are the most expensive type of homes. Like the single family homes are very, where only one family can live. So Los Angeles added single family only zones to its code in 1921. It was one of the first cities in the nation to divide houses from apartments. Um, and, it, and again, like more coded language, like in the examples I shared before were used uh, to talk about the desirability of these single family neighborhoods. Uh, everyone's probably familiar with the fact that the trend of growth in single family neighborhoods is is termed white flight. So, you know, that the racial exclusionary nature of single family zoning is, uh, is well known. So that's why now we call it exclusionary zoning. So I have, so just to illustrate how single family zoning is so exclusionary. I have two examples from my own neighborhood in Santa Monica where I live. Uh, so the left one is the multifamily neighborhood where multiple families are allowed to live in one building. You know, we have uh, apartment buildings and condos in these buildings. So, and then the one on the right is the single family neighborhood, which is actually just two blocks away. These buildings are literally just two blocks away from each other. And the buildings, I think it's remarkable because these neighborhoods look the same. Like the appearance of them is very similar. These two buildings are very, very similar. But the one on the right, it, because of the zoning code of the area, only allows one family to live in that building. But on the left, six families live comfortably in this building. So, I mean, what what possible policy justification could there be? I mean, certainly there's no issue in terms of neighborhood character here. You know, often we talk about zoning and upzoning. People's concerns are about loss of neighborhood character. But you can see from these two images that, you know, when you're talking about multifamily buildings, there's, there's really nothing about it that is um, contrary to the, the building character of these neighborhoods. So, uh, you know, I think that's important from an urban design perspective because uh, we can do multifamily buildings, we can do apartment buildings in a way that integrates seamlessly into neighborhoods. And it's really, I think, you know, we have to recognize that in these conversations, the heart of what's going on is really like when you get down to it, it's like this desire to exclude, you know, to say only one family is allowed in these buildings. So what so what that means is because of these two different zoning codes, the home on the right 
is five times more expensive than the homes on the left, even though they're just two blocks away. And then the uh, diversity changes dramatically between these two these two areas with different zoning. So the in the area on the left, we have an 8% black population, and then you just you cross over that boundary to the single family zoning area, and that drops down to 0.8%. So there is like a strong relationship here between single family zoning and high housing costs and low diversity. And so because of all of these exclusionary policies, housing scarcity is driving our housing affordability crisis. We just don't allow enough homes. You know, it's back to this whole idea of the books. We don't allow the vertical stacking of, of books or homes in this case. And so we don't, we just literally do not have room for the housing that we need. And so this, this issue of housing scarcity is driving our very severe housing affordability crisis. And you can see that here in LA, We've, but it, this, this image really illustrates the problem because this is a giant parking lot, a giant empty parking lot in the middle of downtown where lots of people want and need to live, you know, where we have a huge problem of homelessness and yet like we just have this big empty space where homes could be. Um, you can see here uh, the relationship between housing scarcity and high housing costs. Um, LA is, you know, has the highest amount of housing scarcity and the highest housing costs. So it's really, there is this driving cause of housing scarcity, which is related to lack of housing affordability. And then I just want to touch on the environmental impact of housing scarcity. So, um, and this is another example from my hometown, Santa Monica. So, you know, we, we don't build enough housing in Santa Monica. Obviously we have housing scarcity, we have high housing costs. So I have a friend here who works as a hairdresser who lived here for a long time, but he could no longer afford the housing costs here. He had a family and uh, he needed to move somewhere where housing costs were cheaper. So he moved all the way to Lancaster, but he still works in Santa Monica. We still have a lot of jobs in Santa Monica. So he commutes every day, this two and a half hour commute each way. So what does that mean? Not only does he not have enough time for his family, that's a huge source of greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, like our jobs housing imbalance is is contributing to um, these high greenhouse gas emissions. That's a climate change problem. Another problem is that uh, areas out, um, these exurban areas have to destroy the natural environment to make room for that housing. So even before my friend moved out there, there, that environmental habitat had to be destroyed. And then there's the issue of energy efficiency. Um, single family, low density neighborhoods are much less efficient at using energy than dense neighborhoods, you know, which are able to be like more compact. They share many walls. You know, uh, the infrastructure doesn't need to be as large to, to connect places. It's really like this low density, these low en density areas that are very energy inefficient. Um, and then obviously these are huge fire hazards out in these exurban neighborhoods. But I think it's important to remember, you know, my friend didn't want to have to live out in Lancaster. He wanted to live in Santa Monica. You know, it's, it's not by choice that he's contributing to all of these environmental problems it's because of the policies that we have in these desirable um, expensive urban areas where we have lots of jobs um, that we're really driving this environmental problem. So what if we change our zoning and land use policies to allow more housing? Um, you know, this is a before picture, a low density area with lots of parking. You can imagine, you know, more vibrant, diverse communities. Um, with thriving local businesses and lots of walkability. I think it's a very positive vision. More housing means more livability. It means more enjoyable places that you can walk around in, healthier businesses with more foot traffic and employees living close to jobs, less car dependence, and less traffic. So really positive outcomes. Oh, and of course, more diversity. So how can we support inclusive neighborhoods and ensure we say yes in my backyard? These are just like a couple of general policy ideas, but if you want to learn more, definitely check out our website, abundanthousingla.org, and we have our full policy agenda on there. But number one, we have to change culture. 
uh, apartments are treated as a bad thing and they're not. Everyone is entitled to housing they can afford. We need to ensure more representation and community input. We need to make sure it's not just dominated by wealthy white voices. Um, we need to promote affirmatively furthering fair housing. That's the idea that everyone um, of any economic level should, should be able to live in their neighborhood of choice. And we need to promote urban infill density in the housing element update process, which is happening throughout California right now. Look at all potential funding for affordable housing. We need very creative solutions. And we need to use renters protections to reduce displacement. So I think, uh, yeah, I'm just gonna wrap it up there. Uh, check out our website if you'd like to see more policy ideas or read more about Abundant Housing LA and you know, sign up to receive our weekly newsletter. So thanks so much. So Leonora, thank you very much for framing the questions and the issues that we have related to the availability of housing. Um, it really is, has become a major crisis within, within our community. So I think uh, what we'll move on to here is with uh, Jeff uh, Oberdorfer. Uh, so Jeff, uh, the, the questions in a way that Leonora uh, posited uh, about how we make our neighborhoods into something that uh, really can serve people of all ethnicities, of all ages, of all income groups, uh, how do we set about making that happen? What's being done to date that uh, Im impedes that? So Jeff uh, is, uh, Jeff Oberdorfer, FAA, is an architect specializing in multifamily housing, particularly affordable housing and special needs housing. As the former executive director of First Community Housing, Jeff led First Community Housing to become a national model in sustainable multifamily projects. He's an adjunct professor, professor teaching housing studio at the University of San Francisco Department of Architecture and consults with communities and nonprofit organizations. So Jeff, please. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes. Hillary, can you go back to the first slide? There you go. So what I wanted to talk about is an issue that um, I perceive, especially in the um, South Bay area of San Francisco, and that is that um, because of the housing crisis, which is severe, we're tending to build a lot of small units so that we can have our unit counts up. And I'm afraid that too many decisions about what kind of units that we're building are leaving out families and we're leaving out the diversity that families could bring to a downtown. And probably the most advanced plan for bringing families downtown that I've seen is the one in Toronto, which is actually called Building Complete, Complete Communities, where the town realized, the city of Toronto realized that the downtown was because of its policies and because of the number of units that were being built for single people, were pushing families out of the downtown. Uh, next slide, please. So Toronto came up with a really interesting plan for downtown. And is, they're not the only city that's done that. Uh, Long Beach just passed an ordinance, Vancouver, Seattle, Chicago. Uh, Vancouver requires 25% of multifamily units to be two bedrooms or more. And um, the example on the upper right is from the Toronto plan, growing up, planning for children in new vertical communities, where they hired architects to actually do plans for um, family environments. You can see on the plan on the upper right that there's actually a place to store um, carriages when you enter your apartment. And this is really an excellent, an excellent plan to take a look at. The slides on the left are from the city of San Jose, uh, where I was principal architect at the redevelopment agency from 1995 to 2000. And the intention of the downtown San Jose plan was always to be family friendly. And you can see the fountains uh, on the upper left and also in the park on the uh, lower left across from the Tech Museum which has children there all day long, every day on tours from their schools. 
So families were considered a component of the uh, original urban design plan for San Jose. The interesting thing is that one of five households are multi-generational. And of the 18.4 million multifamily projects, only 1.6 million have three bedrooms or more. Next slide, please. So one of the things that has been uh, discussed in many of the cities that are doing uh, plans for bringing more families downtown is that one of the issues they found in New York and Toronto and Chicago was the key to bringing families downtown was friendly streets and sidewalks. And this should be uh, really nothing for a surprise for those of us who are watching and talking today. But just to get a little bit more uh, contextual with that, people are now seeing that the streets that they live in downtown are part of the community. And until about 15 years ago, streets were out of bounds for architects and urban designers. That was the turf of the uh, public works department and civil engineers. And you can see on the photos on the bottom that we're starting to look at streets as a, a little bit more entertaining and component of the city instead of the strict division between the built environment on both sides of the street. We're even seeing that for the first time that I've ever seen it, retailers are giving up parallel parking spaces to have seating outside. And this was happening even before COVID. Next slide, please. So to bring this home a little bit more, this is the Gish family apartments that I did when I was at First Community Housing. Jerry King was the architect. And this is a 35 unit family housing project. And you can see that it's right across the street from light rail. And there's a 7-Eleven on the first floor. So this is 35 units, 70% of them are two and three bedrooms. The slide on the bottom left is Robert, who uh, lets me use this photo. He has two live-in providers, which means he needs a three bedroom apartment. So we have one autistic, tenant living there with two providers, so that's a three bedroom, and some seniors that need uh, providers that have two bedrooms. So when we're talking about family apartments of two, three, and four bedroom, it's not just families, it's people who need support. The interesting thing now is this was built quite a while ago, and if this site was now part of an RFP, if the city or the county owned it, was going out for proposals, and I submitted this 35 unit family project and somebody submitted a 70 unit SRO, almost definitely the 70 unit SRO would be approved over the 35 unit family project because it's more units. So one of the themes I have for today is that we need to start counting people and not units. And that's why we have so many single occupancy units being built so we can count more units. And this is something that's very, very harmful, I think, to having a diverse downtown culturally and just having children and families downtown. So uh, next slide, please. Now, one of the things that I started at First Community Housing was an EcoPass program where everyone who lived at one of our properties got a free transit pass every year for all Santa Clara County light rail and buses. And what was interesting about this is that after about eight years of the program, we started seeing in some of our surveys that people were using this free Eco Pass on weekends and in the summer but not that frequently. So we got a grant from the uh, Enterprise Community Foundation to do a real deep dive into how people were using these free passes. And what we found out, which was kind of surprising, is that if a light rail station or a bus stop was a block or two away or even across the street and it was perceived as being unsafe to get there, either at the stop itself or the walk to it, people would not use the pass. They would take their cars. This is especially true for women and elderly people who either worked at night or left in the morning in the dark and came back at dark. 
We found that on the weekends, families would use these eco passes, and particularly in the summer when we had more daylight. So there's a definite relationship to safe streets and people using uh, transit. Next slide, please. So in looking at the preponderance of micro units now, this is something I put together just to show the difference between four micro units of 250 square feet each and a three bedroom uh, handicap accessible apartment of the exact same square footage. And you'll notice that uh, because of COVID and also because of feedback we've gotten from clients that we do have workstations in uh, each of the bedrooms. And what we figured out doing some of these smaller units at First Community Housing is when we get to about 360 square feet of an SRO or a, a micro unit that we can actually fit in a small nook for a workstation. But what's interesting about this to me is when we would show these plans to um, housing uh, developers that we're working with or with cities, they would say, isn't it expensive to do a three bedroom with two bathrooms, two full bathrooms for ADA? And I think about it and I look at the four units above where they actually have four times as many kitchens, four times as many bathrooms. Uh, they don't have to have a balcony, which multifamily usually does. So in some ways, even though we may talk about um, affordable by design or sustainable by design, the micro units are not sustainable when compared to a family unit. Matter of fact, they're probably more expensive per square foot because that's where all the electrical and plumbing is in the kitchens and bathrooms. So I'm not speaking against micro units or SROs. I think they're really necessary. But I do think we need to realize that from a sustainable point of view, a three bedroom is actually more sustainable in terms of appliances, uh, utility hookups, metering, than these smaller units are. And on the right, you'll see a um, little photo of my seven-year-old granddaughter's workstation for uh, her first year in first grade, which many, many people now are dealing with because of COVID. And I think it's something we need to start looking at with um, some of the units we're designing. How do you get a workstation in there that's actually something somebody could use? So again, count people, not units. Next slide, please. So I wanted to talk about two projects who are kind of unique just because as architects, I think we like to look at projects as well. This is 1585 Studios. Uh, Jerry King was the architect on this. He was also the architect on Gitch, which I just showed. And this is a fairly unusual project because it's 27 units, uh, basically studios, about 380 square foot each, all for developmentally disabled. Now, normally, we would not do a uh, single use building just for one, um, special needs use. Uh, we tend to do multifamily with 25% of the tenants being a special needs, but this was such an unusual lot. You can see that it's a strange shape. It's a nanogram. It has nine sides. And it's also in the floodplain and it has a pretty strict height limit of about 32 feet, which is why we have flat roofs with no green roofs and no PVs on the roof. And the only way to build this was when we first looked at it, because the price of the land was so inexpensive, we had to buy it. And we knew that the only re way we could actually build anything there, and people have been trying for years and years, which is why the price was so inexpensive for the land, is to do it without parking. So the city of Mountain View allowed us, with a traffic study, to prove that uh, developmentally disabled tenants do not drive, which they don't. So we're able to build this with just 10 parking spaces, one ADA and the rest for visitors and staff. And this was a LEED Platinum building uh, right on El Camino Real in Mountain View, a block from downtown. So it's a really strategic site to do some really good architecture for a special needs population. Most of the tenants come from Palo Alto and um, Mountain View. And the reason this project is so specific for them is that development of disabled seem to grow up with the ability to memorize transit routes 
where they live. And when they have to be relocated to another uh, affordable housing project, it takes them a long, long time to learn the uh, transit routes. Next slide, please. So this one's for Nathan. This is the 4th Street family apartments in San Jose, 100 family apartments, uh, very different than the project before. 70% of the units are two and three bedroom. Uh, it's two stories of parking with seven stories of uh, housing above. Uh, Fisher Friedman were the architects. There's a green roof on the uh, top of the building, which is basically for indigenous native plants. It's only accessible uh, by keying the elevator to open on that floor. So we do a lot of tours up there. But one of the issues with family housing, uh, especially out of the larger cities and getting into some of the most suburban cities like San Jose, is that the parking requirements for families are pretty high. And the slide in the middle with uh, a group of people looking at the, um, what was then a German uh, lift, we got 30 of these for the building. And this is the uh, training session with um, first community housing staff, John Stewart Company staff and the city. We did these just for three bedroom units and we did 30 of them. And I was really hesitant at first to see if they would work. That's why we did three bedrooms because as soon as some of the three bedrooms would have two cars. And they worked so well that I wish that I had actually done more because we got a lot of complaints from the housing department that the cost per unit was high, although they were comparing the unit costs of a concrete and steel building with traditional wood frame four to six story buildings. But now, and you see on the bottom right, we have these new systems of uh, electronic parking and there's a lot of them going up in LA on um, fairly high-end uh, condominiums. And if I had this ability now, and you can see how tall the ceilings are in the uh, floors that we have parking, I probably could have done three more floors of uh, units and had 130 units and the cost per unit would have come down. And of course we would have provided more housing. So I think this is an interesting thing to look at. And I think there's a real potential for bringing families that usually have higher parking requirements into our downtown by using more innovative parking. And the slide on the upper right is a family who just got all their eco passes for free transit. And um, that's my last slide, I believe. So thank you. Gwen, you're muted. Uh, Jeff, thank you very much. Uh, I think it's, it's really, we need to look at the context within which housing is developed and all of the uh, uh, infrastructure that makes that happen. So I, I think the, 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 that awareness and I think that part of the fear of density is that the infrastructure doesn't keep up with it. So I'm going to uh, move on now to uh, Robin Hughes. Um, and uh, Robin, uh, how, do we, how do we make our communities work for all? Uh, it seems like, uh, unfortunately, too many of them are very monochromatic, whether it be uh, whites, whether it be Latinos, whether it be black Americans, um, and, and even in terms of income, uh, they, they can tend to be very uh, monochromatic. What, what can we do to change that? What, what should we do to change that? So uh, Robin uh, Hughes has been actively involved in affordable housing and community development for over 30 years. And, and uh, in her 23 years as the leader of abode communities, Hughes has transformed the organization into a nationally and locally recognized affordable housing provider as well as the leading provider of environmentally sustainable affordable housing in California. She's responsible for the development and executive oversight of strategic initiatives that expand the organization's impact through the production of affordable housing across California. Uh, she's a board chair of the Housing Partner Net Network and vice chair of California Housing Consortium and serves as on the boards of the California Community Reinvestment Corporation 
the Community Development Trust and UCLA's Zyman Center Affordable Housing Advisory Council. Her expertise is highlighted by four years as a city planning commissioner for the city of Los Angeles. So, um, Robin, uh, take it away. Uh, thank you, Gwen, and um, thank you for having me here today. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be among this esteemed panel of experts in this area. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit of history on abode communities, mostly uh, because of our roots, and then I will uh, expand on some of the conversation that Leonora had around affirmatively uh, furthering uh, housing, fair housing. And then I'd like to end on a uh, innovative initiative that Abode Communities is pursuing uh, to bring a creative solution to supportive housing. So um, I particularly wanted to, uh, I'm not advancing one moment, there we go. Wanted to start with a little bit of uh, history on Abode Communities, mostly because of our connection with the uh, California AIA. We were founded in uh, 1968 coming out of the civil rights movement when community design centers were uh, established throughout the country. And uh, again, I wasn't there, but my history was that Whitney Young was keynote speaker at the National AIA Conference and challenged the architecture uh, community to engage in the civil rights movement through the physical built environment. And through that initiative, or through that um, initiative in that day, community design centers were created throughout the country uh, tied to universities. So we were created by the School of Architecture at USC and the California AIA. And it was a place where professional architects like many of you uh, in this, on this conference uh, were able to volunteer and provide pro bono services to community-based organization doing socially beneficial projects. So, um, many of you may know the first executive director of Abode Communities, Jim Bonner, who spent his career very dedicated to design community development and serving low income people. So that's the important part of our origin. We have evolved over the years to become, years to become this multidiscipline organization that includes, we still have our architectural studio in house uh, that provides design services to our portfolio as well as other nonprofits, and we have our real estate development group, our, our uh, property management company, and we also bring social services to our affordable housing development. So we have our resident services group. Um, Leonor did a wonderful job talking about the uh, history and background of, ex uh, of exclusionary land use policies. And um, I wanna focus a little bit on you know, how we find solutions to addressing um, the, the land use past that, that we've had as a region, as a, as a society. Um, the Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing Act was adopted in 1968 uh, as part of the Civil Rights Act. And it was um, specifically adopted to say, to, to bring an end to or dismantle the discrimination and segregation that exist in, uh, in housing. And the intent was to ensure that HUD uh, and all of the programs it administered were uh, affirmatively furthering, furthering the purpose of the act. There were further amendments to uh, the uh, AFFH uh, that also pushed that responsibility down to cities, counties, states, and housing authorities who uh, provide to receive grants or benefits from um, HUD, that those agencies were also had a responsibility to ensure that the concepts, the principles, the laws under the Fair Housing Act were implemented. So what does it mean uh, to be to uh, affirmatively further fair housing? Um, it means that we're not practicing discrimination in our housing and uh, economic development programs or government, local government, that we're taking actions to undo historic patterns of segregation and discriminatory practice. 
and that it also means that uh, we are providing um, access to better education, better jobs, better living conditions, that we are implementing programs where cities and states and counties are implementing programs that provide access to all, um, that, that access to all in, in terms of better education, jobs, and, and housing conditions. It also means that we're not concentrating poverty in certain communities, that we are uh, building housing everywhere for everyone and not simply uh, segregating it into communities. I think, you know, as a society, as we look at LA and as Leonora has presented in her, her presentation, um, we're not quite doing a good job at this and that there's so much more that we could be doing to uh, ensure that we have housing for all in every part of our cities and counties. Um, as I talk to my colleagues in the industry around housing policies and programs, uh, I do become concerned that there is a drive, a push to uh, push housing policy program and finance into um, High, area, high areas of opportunity or high resource areas. And I really believe that we need to have a balance, that we need to achieve a balance of building affordable housing as an equity investment. And by equity, I mean uh, equity among race, income, and equality as opposed to financing, uh, and high opportunity neighborhoods, while it still is an economic stimulus in low resource and moderate resource neighborhoods as well. So we do need to find a balance in our policy and how we're implementing our programs. So in terms of our affordable housing finance system, um, I sit on a number of, of policy programs and groups and working groups. And um, we are seeing that more and more our low-income housing tax credit programs, our private activity bonds, are creating incentives for, or requirements for building affordable housing in high opportunity neighborhoods. Um, which again, it's a way to incentivize developers to begin to develop in these neighborhoods. But um, they're also trying to make that balance to ensure that we continue to invest in low resource neighborhoods or in moderate resource neighborhoods, and particularly those neighborhoods where gentrification is occurring. And we want to make sure that housing continues to be built so that people who have historically lived in those neighborhoods are able to benefit from um, the investment that's happening in that neighborhood by providing affordable homes for them. Um, the other thing that I'd like to hit on that I think uh, affirmatively furthering fair housing uh, could make a difference, and again, Lenore uh, touched on this as well, is through our land use policy. You know, over the past, I would say, four or five years, we've seen uh, re really strong legislation come out of our state legislature around streamlining the production of affordable housing and permanent supportive housing. And many of these tools allow for, um, for housing to be built with greater development incentives, but also with, um, uh, with expedited processes and in some cases, uh, exemption from CEQA. And all of these things help to ensure that we're able to build in neighborhoods where perhaps we typically get community pushback or community opposition through, through NIMBYism if, if uh, the process is streamlined and uh, if we're exempt from certain land use requirements or even CEQA, then we're able to avoid uh, that, those, that opposition. One of the things that Abundant Housing LA is working on is something that I have been thinking about since I was on the planning commission in the city of Los Angeles, is that we should absolutely be building housing everywhere, affordable housing everywhere in our city. And one way to do that is through our housing elements and other land use documents that we have. So while Abundant LA is working on an effort in the city of Los Angeles to incorporate a fair distribution of RENA, um, RENA numbers throughout the city, I think we should be advocating for this to be a statewide legislation so that as city and counties are adopting uh, their housing elements, 
they are incorporating a fair distribution of affordable housing uh, through their community plans. And if we could even take it to the next step that in the housing element process, we are dealing with en environmental approvals as well, in particular for uh, sites that are related to um, affordable housing development. This will go, would go a long way and um, sort of diversifying where we're building our housing, but also expediting, expediting the production of affordable uh, and supportive housing uh, in, our, in our local regions. Um, now I'd like to touch on a, uh, a streamlining solution that Abode Communities is pursuing uh, to build supportive housing in the city of Los Angeles. Uh, this is a collaboration between Abode Communities and our partners, uh, LA Family Housing, Mercy Housing, the California Community Foundation, and Factory OS. Um, so many of you may know that the city of Los Angeles passed a bond uh, two, three years ago now, uh, HHH, that provided capital for the production of permanent supportive housing. As part of that, the mayor's office and the housing department set aside funding specifically for innovation around the production of affordable, uh, permanent supportive housing. Abode Communities, Mercy, and LA Family Housing were uh, one of the awardees. We received uh, um, a $39 million HHH award. 35 million of which will provide capital subsidies for our projects. And then 4 million we will set up into a revolving loan fund, which I will speak um, in a moment in more detail about. But through this initiative, our collaboration is sort of combining the um, traditional housing finance system that we use to produce our, our affordable housing, but bringing the innovation of margin, modular construction and standardization to our process to produce uh, supportive housing. So I'll go in a little more detail about the standardization of our site selection, our design, and our construction financing. Uh, but the goal is to do proof of concept so that what we're working on, we can scale uh, and we can also replicate over time. So in terms of standardizing site selection and design, um, our collaboration is really working together. Uh, I would say one of the things that we are very committed to is building this supportive housing throughout the city and quite frankly, avoiding those council districts where there's been a high concentration of permanent supportive housing already. So we've looked um, you know, as far south as San Pedro throughout the San Fernando Valley uh, and East LA for, for sites to develop our permanent supportive housing. So we've looked for properties that we can develop by right um, to help reduce the entitlement time. So projects that would be eligible for the transit oriented community um, uh, ordinance here in the city of Los Angeles or the supportive housing ordinance. We're also sort of trying to come up with a, a typical site size and shape uh, in order to bring some standard, standardization as well as just the cost of the land itself. You know, we're estimating that each of our sites and we're looking at perhaps acquiring six sites would be about 60 units or so. And we've come up with a prototype sort of 300, 310 uh, square foot unit for uh, our project. So we're using standard design. Uh, we're using the same architectural studio, which is about communities architectural studio and we're also taking advantage of the supportive housing ordinance and we're not, um, not parking, we're not providing parking for any of the residential units just for the, excuse me, the guest units uh, in, the, in the project. So this is a sort of a standard building floor plan prototype um, for one of the sites we currently have under site control. Uh, the ground floor, which is to the, uh, the left of the screen, includes all the common area components, including the office spaces for the supportive housing programming, uh, such as case management, counseling, group meetings, and things like that. The second floor, as you can see, are very efficient uh, 
studio units um, um, designed within the development. And this particular site, which is in San Pedro, I think we're going up to uh, four stories uh, on the project. Um, and then this is sort of a very standard uh, prototype unit that we're using on uh, each of the projects. So, um, you know, it's interesting, Jeff, that it's very similar to the prototypes that you showed sort of earlier. But because we can sort of replicate as much as we can floor plans, building plans, you know, standardized site, uh, we're, we're finding really great efficiency in the, in the work that we do. And then I don't have a slide, but I should, is we're working with Factory OS up in the Bay Area, uh, and they are producing modular, uh, the, the modular units for uh, each of our projects. So we also have standardized way in which we're doing that. And by producing the units in, the, in um, a factory setting, there's great efficiency, reduction in cost due to time, reduction, reduction in overall construction costs, uh, it's more environmentally sound, so we have significant benefits there. So through this initiative, we are proposing to produce um, you know, potentially six developments, about 360 supportive housing units. And uh, in terms of savings on, in cost and time, uh, from our traditional affordable housing development, we anticipate reducing our overall costs by 18%. And the overall time, we're, more, we're cutting uh, more than half of the time off of our, our typical development process. The cost uh, savings, of course, are in the construction costs, but they're also in the soft costs as, as our construction uh, timeline is reduced, then our construction interest goes down, if our overall cost goes down, then our, our financing cost goes down. So there's a lot of reduction in cost. And in terms of time, you know, our pre-development timeline by focusing on sites that are by right, it's reduced in half in construction. Um, we go from you know, 18, 20 month construction to a 10 month construction uh, period. So again, our goal here is to, uh, you know, create proof of concept that this modular approach will reduce the overall cost and timing to produce um, housing, that there is a demand for this so that we can scale and replicate the work that we're doing. Um, and I didn't focus a lot on the, the financing, the construction financing, but we're hoping that um, this revolving loan that we're creating, that we're having to raise capital for, that the market, um, you know, as, as we show proof of concept, reduce risk, will become traditional conventional financing uh, that again can scale over time. You know, so in the end, our goal here is to uh, produce permanent supportive housing faster so that we can more quickly move people from experiencing the homeless on the streets into permanent supportive housing. Um, so thank you, and I will take questions at, at the end of the presentation. Well, thank you very much, Robin. Uh, that is fascinating and I think important work that you're doing there. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, so we'll move on at this time to Roger Sherman. Um, so Roger, it seems like there's a, a questions that come up in terms of diversity of housing and how we can mix up housing. Uh, how, how can we, how can we be creative uh, in terms of uh, looking at uh, alternatives to housing that might be more effective. So Roger Sherman is uh, AIA, is Design Director at Gensler, where he leads the community impact group with projects ranging from permanent supportive housing to non-profit institutional work. Previously, Roger was founder of the Roger Sherman Architecture and Urban Design. His work is featured in Newsweek and Fast Company on CNN and the History Channel and exhibited at Rotterdam and the Venice Biennale. So, uh, Roger, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Gwen. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> let's see if I can, everybody can see what I've got on my screen. Um, should I go to full screen or are you all still seeing my... Full screen would be good. Yeah, go to full okay. screen. How's that? Perfect. 
Okay, great. <clears throat> uh, this is a kind of a great uh, segue from Robin um, because what we, uh, this pro I'm going to simply show you one project that we've been working on amongst the, the number of them that we've been involved with for the uh, past three years over at Gensler since we started the Permanent Supportive Housing Initiative. Uh, Gensler was just, we were just really tired of seeing the the price and of, of things um, skyrocket, as many of you know, from what was 550,000 a unit to now what looks like over 700,000 at times. It's just, it's more than most people who are actually earning a, a, a fairly high salary um, could even afford <clears throat> in building a house on a single family lot like the one that you're you're seeing. So um, the, the project, which is called Urban Awning, was spawned out of a, a desire to really take apart what we felt was a broken model and to reassemble it again, um, figuring <clears throat> by, in effect, hacking the code and figuring out ways to actually rework a lot of the assumptions um, and still do something that could actually pass, um, pass uh, through uh, zoning and, and building and safety. Um, the reason I'm showing the single family home, which is the obviously the post-war dream of, um, of suburbia, but for all of us, was that <clears throat> even though um, this may not be attainable for everyone um, and maybe sh as on a practical level makes no sense for the city, there is still something at a very subconscious level that everybody wants in terms of the values that it represents. And so we sought in the Urban Awning Project to, to make more out of less. Um, and, and you'll see sort of how we did that. Um, we made several different observations and took um, and, and transformed those into a series of tactics, which were, dri which were used as drivers toward reducing cost and, um, and also the amount of time that it would take to produce. One is um, a real understanding that we had a decided advantage and even a leg up in Southern California in building more with a, and taking advantage of the mild climate that we have. So we, we sought to, amongst other things, directly attack an overt use of mechanical, uh, so-called active environmental systems in favor of using passive, <clears throat> just common sense ways of using cross ventilation and natural daylight <clears throat> to do that. Um, we also, and you'll see little bits and pieces of what has been presented by others today, um, looking at economies um, of size um, and, um, and square footage where we could find them. So urban awning, um, <clears throat> in short, it's a prototype uh, project that is now finding its way into app implementation in, um, a, in a few different parts of Los Angeles in, in differing forms. It's, it basically works on the basis of a two-story project that has the density of a four or five-story building. It also is uh, roof forward as opposed to wall forward, which makes it a lot uh, more palatable to a lot of NIMBY groups wh who see this as a kind of very large scale version of a ranch house. <clears throat> we, um, it's predicated on the idea that basically if you build a big roof over the project, whose job is to basically provide weather protection from, uh, from rain and from sun, and also to serve as a solar umbrella, um, the building, the units that are actually underneath don't have to be weatherized and therefore you save a great deal of money. So this is a kind of typical section cutting through it in which you see three different unit types with a service corridor that, that uh, penetrates through the bottom of them. On the left, you have a so-called double unit, which is effectively like a townhouse, which can sleep up to three people. Um, it's about 350 square feet. <clears throat> um, on the other, t uh, this, the unit that's on the lower right is the so-called flat, which is an ADA sized unit for one person. And then we have a split unit, which has a, a kind of mezzanine loft, which can, which can um, uh, uh, sleep up to two people. The flat, just to give you a sense of relative size, is 177 square feet. And you're going to all be asking yourselves, well, that's just inhumane. How can you possibly do that? Well, we think it's actually kind of unconscionable that we're building such large units as required by a lot of the funding sources that are currently being relied upon 
by by a lot of our our clients and so we sought to figure out how to redial um, the balance between private space and public space and collective space within a housing development so that everybody still was assured of their own kitchenette and bathroom and they had a sleeping area, but the, but we actually start, sought to really collectivize the dining and, and living areas so that people would find those outside of their own unit in a way that actually would also combat problems of loneliness, which are becoming endemic to, um, to, uh, to our society in general, born out of the single family zoning. We were remembered, I'm sorry for the, the uh, this is a very old photo, but a certain people like Gwyn will remember this is a um, this is a very well known house from the 1980s built by an architect named Brian Murphy in Topanga Canyon. He did the very same thing. He basically built a house for himself where he built a Butler building roof, and then he basically put all the rooms of the house underneath it. And you basically lived in this kind of micro environment, which required no no um, heating and air conditioning. Um, well, actually, we have a very small heating unit. You'll see here um, an analysis of the environmental systems. Uh, we use ideas of natural convection to draw air through. Um, the south side of the of the large awning roof is for is with solar shingles panels. the the uh, The north side of it actually is also shingled shingled in order to both allow uh, to shade uh, to shade that side of the roof and at the same time to um, to keep rain off of the buildings. Um, we worked from the very get-go with AEI uh, mechanical engineers um, up in Simi Valley who, um, who figured out ways in which um, those two-story spaces can actually draw air from below and up, up through clear story windows and out and be vented through fans that were, um, that were suspended from the, um, from, the awning, from the awning roof. These are a split apart of each of the different unit types. So you see the, the split unit on the left. You see the, uh, the townhouse unit on the right. Um, these, um, I, there's a lot to get into here, which I don't really have time to do. So those of you will say, well, you can't have step ladders um, in a unit. It's not, it's not um, allowed by the code, et cetera, et cetera. We're not, this is not 100% ADA, but we did end up, having to look at ways very creatively of, of calling, of, of pointing out to the county and to the city that when they build emergency housing, bridge housing, and they have bunk beds, they do the exact same thing, but somehow semantically, that's okay. <clears throat> so we called these bunk beds and we, we use the, county, uh, the county's own uh, practices against themselves in order to achieve them. So the townhouses um, have walkways. They they have a kind of neighborly feel by using shutters again and window openings and Dutch doors in order to regulate airflow and also to create a kind of social interface at the front of the units that um, that encourages neighborliness. The roofs you will see are actually out of fiberglass that allow natural light to filter down into the unit. Therefore. Uh, minimizing the amount of electricity that needs to be used during the day in the unit itself. We have planters that are embedded in the, the, in the, uh, the porch roof over the lower unit. <clears throat> and then we, um, the, the project I should point out um, was the product of a brainstorming session that took place between Gensler, Tom Gilmore and Associates, the developer, um, Rick Jacobs of the uh, the Mayor's um, Accelerator for America, um, which um, which introduced which in turn introduced the group to the National Carpenters Union. So what you're looking at today um, in this photo is an actual full scale mock up of the of of the units that I was just showing you that was built at the Carpenters Union training facility in Las Vegas, and then we actually. Um, invited the mayor and the council and the city council of Los Angeles to come out and visit, which they did. And they all were uh, astonished and remarked at how their own children uh, were living um, in units that were larger and a lot more money that were not nearly as nice as these are because they felt incredibly spacious. Um, and so that really helped us kind of catalyze a lot of interest on the part of the electeds in trying to find sites within the city of Los Angeles that, um, that could accommodate this. So here in this photo, you can see the solar panels kind of stepping up um, on the roof. This is kind of not entirely finished out, but 
you get a pretty good idea. All the, all the materials are in one form or another uh, recyclable. There are also materials that are not built to, uh, they're not built to last 50 years, um, but they're also a lot less expensive and can last 20 years. So there's an idea of kind of replaceability as well. I should also mention that this is not aimed at um, the most high acuity cases of homeless, but the lower acuity cases, we felt as an ethical position, honestly, that if we could build something for half the cost that would accommodate uh, more people um, at a, in a city in which there's a rate of three people on the street dying every week, then we ought not to make the perfect the enemy of the good. And then there are a lot of people who could really use the kinds of units that these represent. So this doesn't really require a service provider in the conventional sense of a lot of permanent supportive housing. Um, this is, um, we were using in a very Japanese way, every little bit of space that we could, including the cavity between studs in order to become shelving. Uh, you can see the quality of the natural light. That's one of the council people up on the, in the loft area and the fan and so on. You can the, the kitchenette is located just behind the stepladder and the, the bathroom is actually tucked in behind those shelving areas um, with, a, um, with a sliding door. So one of the important features of um, urban awning was the fact that it was, it was designed to be scalable in the same way that Robin was talking about, so that the prototype was really in the section through the building, but the actual configuration that the building itself could take would be adaptable to a variety of conditions. This is one that's a one acre site that we found in Buscaino's district in Wilmington. This accommodates about 120 people on a lot. Again, think in terms of beds. I agree with Jeff, beds, not units. Um, so this is um, actually 120 beds, but it's even more people that are in this, which is which is high density, but ironically does not look like a high density project. With the with the roofs lifted off, you can see how those units kind of lay out. There are gardens and the collective spaces that you can see outside of those buildings, which are under the big roof, but have natural ventilation, views, a shelter from the rain, and are planted uh, with gray water systems. Um, this shows a little bit of how the section works of the units that are under the big awning roof. And then this is a little bit of a sample of how those collective spaces for dining and just milling about would work where people, the people in their units have the privacy, <clears throat> I think that they really desire, but there's a feeling that they're in a one large house with a sense of protection from the elements um, in very pleasant ways. There are different orientations. There are several of these collective spaces around the building. And so depending upon the time of year, the environmental engineer we were working with um, was making a point about the fact that this, that one of the great advantages of the project is that it affords people the ability to migrate, what he called migrate, uh, around the project depending upon the time of year. So in your unit, when it's colder in the winter, you can migrate up to the loft to sleep where it's warmer, and keep the windows closed. And when it's colder, um, I'm sorry, when it's, um, when it's, when it's warmer in the summertime, you migrate down to where it's cooler, down at the bottom of the unit. Same thing with these collective spaces where some of them have, uh, have um, direct sunlight um, on the northern side and you can go there in the winter time and in the, in the summer when it's hotter, you can be in spaces like this under the solar panels, which is recollective once again of these, these um, ran the classic California ranch house. We then had an opportunity to, to, to explore with the county at Ranchos Los Amigos, um, a very large site in which we're proposing 340 units that would actually be well in excess of the number of units in terms of beds that would actually have three such projects, each of which would be oriented. It's the same typology, but, it would, but each of the interstices of the buildings would actually represent a different type of population. We had, um, students, we had low acuity homeless, um, and we had others who were just up uh, starting out um, in their careers. Uh, the, the, the ability of the units to interchange and be used in different mixes within a, any given section, meaning both two townhouses or only the smaller units also affords, its, affords it this ability to adapt. 
this is what it looks like. It has an orchard, a community garden, um, various play areas for where there are families. And then we were also approached um, by uh, the Salvation Army, which has a large um, former military base headquarters in Bell, about the idea of taking this one acre section of airplane hangar and placing urban awning inside of it, in which in this case, we didn't need to create the awning. We simply needed to make cuts in the existing roof of the airplane hangar in order to bring in natural light and ventilation. And we were able to um, accommodate about 60, 64 units, probably about um, 90 or 100 people uh, beds in this, in this project. This is what that would look like. And then we also explored it um, at the horse barns at Fairplex for Miguel Santana. Uh, where we showed how the horse barns could be converted into a kind of lower density version of the um, of the awning. They have nine of these buildings that you can see on the, in the lower image. And so you could virtually create a neighborhood of these awnings um, with use, reusing these buildings that right now really don't have much use that are really underutilized. So, uh, I'm happy to take um, questions. I'll simply close by saying that we had a very detailed cost estimate done um, about uh, a month ago. And these, um, these, uh, these buildings are coming in at uh, 100, under $150,000 per unit, per unit versus the $300,000 a unit that we're getting from Factory OS which was on a smaller project, Robin, of only 100 units, proved to have no savings over stick built. So I'm really happy um, that you're doing, you're proving out by doing 340 units that it's actually the economy of scale that can achieve that. Um, I think in our case, it was, it was not by going with modular construction, but by, by a prefabricated panelized systems that would be produced by the carpenters in Las Vegas, by which we're able to ch achieve those dramatic savings as well as through the minimalization, minimization of use of, of, um, of environmental technologies and the reduction of size per unit and the collectivization of, of living space. Thank you. Thank you, Roger, very much. Um, we're uh, significantly running out of time here. We'd um, uh, generally uh, hope, hope to have finished a little earlier, but uh, I think the conversations that have been coming forth have been very interesting and they've generated some great questions. A number of them are quite technical. Uh, so I think what we're gonna do, I'm gonna ask sort of one overriding policy type of question uh, I may have to cut you off because we do look to finish by 9.30, so we only have about 10 minutes or so uh, to answer this question. But, and I think this is in a way for all of you, uh, the state has sort of stepped in and started mandating to local communities what they can allow and what they cannot allow. Um, and that has caused a lot of angst about the idea of community control and the nature of their communities and displacement that might occur uh, through that. One of these ways in which they've been doing that is through the RENA numbers, the Regional Housing Needs Allocation. For instance, the city of Santa Monica has a RENA number of 8,000, which is uh, about 50 about 50 percent more than what exists already within the city uh, so how that's going to come about how how the communities are going to work with this uh, what is the process moving forward uh, based on that uh, uh, angst or that sort of push and pull between the needs of the state and the better good versus the idea of our individual communities and what they are. So uh, Leonora, do you want to start out? And if you can keep it reasonably brief so we can get some other answers in there too, I'd love it. Yeah, so Abundant Housing LA has been really focused on RENA and housing element advocacy since early last year. And, you know, we advocated for LA, the, for the SCAG region, Southern California Association of Governments region to be, you know, a high number which is, was ultimately 1.4 million. And then we advocated for that distribution to be concentrated more in high cost coastal areas like Santa Monica. 
So, you know, that's how Santa Monica got, it, it's actually closer to 9,000 right now, the arena target for Santa Monica. Um, you know, originally they were going to give Santa Monica like 4,000 units and then put like 14,000 out in Coachella Valley, you know, which doesn't make any sense. So they, they, so they've reversed that a little bit, um, thanks to the coastal plan at SCAG. And so that's moving forward. I think it's a really, op really exciting opportunity, you know, because it is a local control process. I think RENA is exciting because it, it does allow communities to do their own planning about where that housing goes, uh, you know, how they're going to meet those targets, you know, what strategies they want to use. Like that's a, lo that's a local process, but, you know, they are held accountable for, you know, doing the basic duties of government, like providing enough housing for needs, providing housing for their population, you know, addressing exclusion and segregation. So I think, you know, local control can't, it can't include the right to exclude or segregate or be racist, you know, I mean, I think it, the arena process and the housing element update requirements around affirmatively furthering for housing make a lot of sense. You know, cities, cities still do have the ability to plan for housing how they want, but just you know, they have to address segregation and they have to make housing, they have to, to meet housing needs. So I think, you know, that, um, that sort of like is the best of all worlds with the local control and responsibility. And I just, um, just because some people ask questions, this is, um, this is abundant housing at least proposed RENA distribution for the community plan areas in the city of LA, which would, which gets to affirmatively furthering fair housing. So it's like you can see the west side, the high cost, high job areas with rail transit get a much higher arena number than um, than currently, you know, the way housing is distributed where these areas actually have like very low density. So under our plan, a lot of the arena would go to these areas and address exclusion there um, but still, uh, affirmative, like affordable housing would be distributed everywhere, but like the total number would be higher in these areas and a higher percentage of affordable housing would be in, in, um, lower income disinvested communities. So that's just like, if you want to check that out, that's on our website at where should Los Angeles add homes. And I'll put the link in the chat again. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Robin, do uh, you want to uh, address that question a little bit too? Yeah, um, I will, will add, um, I'm on the board of uh, California Housing Consortium and we have been um, much a part of the streamlining legislation that's come from the state. Uh, and I will say that it's, it's triggered by the fact that the state has a housing crisis and two, that so many localities uh, we're not producing, providing available land, providing incentives uh, and at a level that uh, would produce housing. So I think the you know, elected officials at the state level were saying, well, if it's not going to happen locally, how can we create some enforcement and accountability as well as incentives to, to, to make it happen? Uh, and from an affordable housing advocate standpoint, uh, we think that's the right direction because so many cities were reluctant to build multifamily affordable housing development. Um, I think what, what we've learned, the state legislators have learned, is that we have such a diverse state that one size doesn't fit all, that we have to think about gentrification and, and local issues. And, um, and that's, in, re, that's resulted in perhaps more engaged conversations with a broad range of advocates around these issues and a lot of negotiation um, at, at the state level uh, and even engagement with local government. But I think it's, it's about accountability uh, without taking complete control away because I think there's still decisions that can be made locally, but it gets to what is really core and that's the production of housing. So Jeff, do you want to uh, jump in on this one? I, I think the RENA counts are a wake up call, but the issue that I focused on today is that what it's doing is making people produce more and more smaller and smaller units to get those unit counts up. 
So I think one is uh, we found great success with ADUs in suburban areas. Some cities like San Jose have suburban areas within the city limits. And um, some communities like Campbell, which is right outside of the uh, city of San Jose adjacent, has a light rail station. And they're afraid that with the state rules, they're going to have to build seven story buildings in a community that's mostly three stories. So I think it's a real challenge for architects to come up with ways to creatively design something that's contextual. And I think there's a lot of models now in the missing middle uh, community of some of the diagrams that are being done by the missing middle advocates that uh, densify suburban areas. And I think that's one way we can go. So uh, a question for Heidi uh, was how can housing projects get more mixed up so that they're not just affordable or market rate, but I have a mix of these units. And I would add to that potentially what, what's historically been called workforce housing. Uh, in other words, those who are uh, working at daily jobs that may not provide a great level of income, but are, that are productive members of our society and are being aced out of some of the more desirable communities. Um, who would like to answer that one? Yeah, you know, I'll start with, I think that's one of the tools that cities have um, is inclusionary housing. And through inclusionary housing, you are able to um, incorporate a range, a range of housing affordability from low income to that missing middle mo modern income to market. Uh, and along with the inclusionary requirements come the development incentives uh, needed to get to greater density, um, uh, variance from any uh, uh, zoning ordinance and things like that. But I do think inclusionary housing is a tool to make that ha happen. Uh, the market by itself is not going to result in integration of different ranges of housing affordability. It really has to be some way for government to support and, and intervene, but also provide incentives. Great, thank you very much. Well, I think we've just about come to our time here. So uh, Rona, I'm going to pass this over to you. I think uh, one of the, the issues is that we didn't get to some of the questions here. Uh, and I would love that we would be able to follow up on some of them. Uh, and uh, I think there's ways of people seeing this session uh, uh, subsequent as well. Huh? Uh, that was really excellent panel. And I, I'll just add as a planning commissioner for the city of Alameda, I see housing projects every, almost every planning meeting. And it would just be great to have a, um, if we could collect some of these case studies that have been shared with us and we also have some very good case studies from our COAT committee of all electric housing like we're building in Alameda. So I'll work with our committee to make sure that we put that together in a web resource because the samples that you shared with us were truly inspiring. Thank you. So thank you, Gwen, um, Leonara, Jeff, Robin, Roger, and I'll thank, I'd like to thank the other members of our at really superb urban design committee, uh, Frank Fuller, Nathan Ogle, Maria Ogridziak, Lee Lippert, and uh, we look forward to um, uh, me meeting all of you personally. Um, we will be having another urban design town hall coming up within the, the coming months, so please do join us. As we mentioned earlier, we've recorded the session and it will be available in YouTube and our webpage your learning units should be recorded in about two weeks. As always, you can find information about this program and our other excellent programs in uh, www.aiacalifornia.org. Everyone be safe and uh, don't forget to vote. And um, thank you. Thank you.